worked with um, our national partners as well as many of our uh, the students that are there. And subsequently, we've returned fairly frequently into the Southeast Asia region through Southeast Asia Partnership, working with pastors that are here like Andy, who's sitting in that corner, as well as uh, missionaries like Tim and Paul Lee, who are in that area, um, Skyping in at times, meeting together once a month or every other month to, in order to discuss what's going on in that area for us to learn and to partner in any way we can to, uh, to support the work taking place there. Last few times, I have, I've had the pleasure of traveling with the moderator of our denomination, as well as the pastor of this church, to visit. It's been a fun experience, far beyond just the teaching experience, but just the interaction with the missionaries and laborers there have been a huge blessing to us. And so for us to see many friends, co-laborers out in the field, Laboring so faithfully has been a huge encouragement, and I pray that as you meet with them today, that your questions and your interactions will only enlighten you, encourage you, and perhaps inflame in you a desire to either engage in support from the state side or actually go and be with them in terms of your work there. Uh, This morning, I would love for you to turn with me to Romans chapter 5. We're going to read verses 6 through 11, and we'll come back to the first half of uh, Romans 5, verses 1 through 5 at some point as well. But 6 through 11 is our text for this morning. Hear now the word of the Lord. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Be with us this morning, O Lord. Teach us through your word. Encourage us by your presence. Lord, allow us to see the grand vision of your kingdom work so that with our meager and small gifts, however small that they may be, we may be able to participate in the larger work of your kingdom and work of your church. Teach us even now as our great discipler, for we need your wisdom and strength daily, whether, in the, whether we're in the field or at home. And we ask that, O oh Lord, you will challenge and stretch and mold and shape and nurture us in the way you, you desire us to be. For we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. There is a continuing debate over why Romans might have been written in the first place. We do know that the letter was written to a church that Paul's never visited. In fact, he says several times that he desires to visit the church. We know that he knows a a large group of folks there. If you look at chapter 16 of Romans, where when you get to that part, a lot of people fall asleep because there are a bunch of names. It's like reading through the book of Numbers. But in those 26 names that are listed there, you recognize many, many are, uh, there's a huge diversity within the church. Clearly, four are not slave names, but the rest of them, there's some question mark as to what their background might be. In fact, a great majority of of them could potentially be slaves like Onesimus, who composed that church, and you come to realize the complexities of the relationships in the first century being slightly different than perhaps what you and I face normally in Orange County or many of our cities in Southern California. But in order to capture the reality of what's happening to Paul, as he's readying himself to visit Jerusalem, bringing the gifts prepared by the Gentiles for the Jewish Christians, we recognize that there are a lot of things up in the air for Paul. Uh, A lot of things up in the air because we're not exactly sure what's going to happen to him. He desires to visit Rome, but he's not exactly sure how and when. We also recognize the fact that there are certain uncertainties about his own future as well as his safety. The concern was palpable in in Acts chapter 20 when he brings together the uh, the elders of Ephesus on Miletus, and there they discuss the ministry they had together in Ephesus, and then they cry for one another. And as they cry for one another, the reason for their uh, tears was simply because Paul told them that they may never see him again. 
In this time of uncertainty, many of the letters were composed, and this happens to be one of them. And in this time, in order to capture these complexities happening in Paul's life, some have called Romans his last will and testament. Others have called this a missionary document or a missionary diplomacy introducing himself to a new group, potentially a way that he introduces himself to many others as we recognize that Romans was circulated to different churches. What's intriguing for us to ponder then is, as someone who's either leaving his last words or introducing himself for the first time, what does he tell them? What would you want people to know about you? What would you desire to leave behind in terms of the kind of words and thoughts, as well as the ministries, as well as the the, the kind of dreams that you might have had? And what's intriguing for us is that as he approaches this text, he does approach us with a particular problem that many of our missionary friends, as they go abroad, are focusing upon. And even as I look out, I saw David Stoddard on that uh, uh, video earlier, who's the, uh, the director of, uh, international director for Europe, and I see his father-in-law and mother-in-law here, who were uh, Peter Jones and Rebecca Jones, who were one of the first four uh, MTW missionaries sent out by the PCA, and they also were my professors as well. Not, not just Peter, who taught me in class, Rebecca, who has taught me much outside of class as well through her writings as well as engagement. We recognize that these people are focused in terms of the work that they do. And the question mark is, what is, what is Paul's concern as he writes this letter? Well, he presents to us a global problem, doesn't he? He talks about the dominion of sin. In fact, what is considered the theme verse of Romans, the apostle states, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, he says in 116, 17. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. For in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This salvation brought to us by God through the gospel proclaimed, was made necessary by the fact that there is this pervasiveness of sin, a point that he painstakingly explains from Romans 1.18 through chapter 3, verse 20. His conclusion is very simple, something that you know well. When he says in chapter 3, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one, Paul says. Even if you're not certain about sins, you recognize that there are pollutions and results of sin all around us. When Paul speaks about sufferings in his own life and those around him, he's a realist because all the ups and downs of life does not surprise Paul. Romans 8.18 simply concludes for us when he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, he says, the sufferings of this present time, on this side of glory, before we see God face to face without a veil, as that hymn says, we recognize that sufferings will follow us. He does mean, in some sense, the sufferings of faith. Although he has this in mind, what he calls the sufferings with Christ, And it should not surprise us that he has this in mind in light of the fact that the New Testament regularly reminds us what 1 John tells us when he says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Not exactly the kind of thing that you want to wake up to every morning, that there is opposition to your faith on a daily basis. But what Paul has in mind is not just oppositions to our faith that results in our own pain, as well as our suffering, what he talks about is the sufferings of life that results from sin. On this side of glory, what Paul refers to as this present time, all of creation, he says, is marked by suffering, futility, bondage, all resulting from sin. Thus, creation itself in chapter 8 eagerly longs for freedom and restoration of God. But it's not just the creation, as you know. We human beings experience the sufferings and pain that comes with sin. Thus, in 8.23, he says, not only the creation, 
but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Friends, suffering is all around us, whether from weak and weakening bodies, broken relationships and families, constant natural disasters, struggles through daily uncertainties. These are things that you and I are very familiar with. We daily realize that this world is not our home, and this is not the way it's supposed to be. This is why Paul says we live in weakness, all resulting from sin. In place of order, we have disorder and rebellion. In place of peace, we have discord and brokenness. In place of health, we experience pain and illness. In place of life, we experience death. We are a hot mess at times. But it's not just about generalities that Paul desires to speak about. It's not just about sufferings and pain of life that results from sin. It's not just the results of sin that we see around us in terms of the order and disorder and the society and the bodies that we are weakening in. But he wants us to remind us that the sin is us. He's not speaking in generalities when he brings this home in our passage this morning. Paul describes our condition, your condition and mine, before knowing Christ Jesus this way. He says in chapter 5, verse 6, we are weak. Americans don't like to hear this. We are weak. The human race was marked by impotency, unable to overcome the demands of the law and unwilling to master the temptations of the flesh. How often can we identify with the words of Paul in chapter 7 when he says, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The bad that I don't want to do, I keep on doing. I hope I'm not the only one who feels that way on a daily basis. In verse 6 in chapter 5, he also says we're ungodly. Like the term unrighteous, it signifies moral corruption. The human race, you and I, were not able and not willing to overcome its nature. It reveled in the life that is characterized by the absence of God. We find ourselves searching after and seeking after and following after those things that taste good, make us feel good, but that are, that are ultimately in rebellion against God. He says to us in verse 8, we are sinners. Sinners. Perhaps the most dreaded of the phrases that Americans don't like to hear, because we're all obviously fairly good, we're told. But we are sinners is what Paul says unequivocally and without shame. It speaks not only to our corrupt morality, whereby we seek to do evil on a daily basis, but sinners describes a condition, an inclination towards sin and rebellion against the perfection and the righteousness of God. And we see this even in our own children. I remember one time Table Talk, produced by Ligonier, had this beautiful picture of this baby. And right across his face, in red ink, original sin. <laughs> but those of you who have children understand this quite, quite well, I think. Um, I have two children, Anna and Simeon. Uh, they're taken from Luke 2 with the hopes that one day, like those two names, they will be able to testify to the name of Jesus. Um, we didn't have a third because there is really no third character in there, and Jesus as a name didn't seem very appropriate uh, for someone like me. Um, when Anna was about a year and a half, when she was barely walking and talking fairly well, even at that early age, you can see, you can see how sin grabs a hold of her. We used to say no a lot. I don't know if you do, because we recognized that she was getting into everything. And one of the things she used to love to do was to stuff things into our VCR opening. For those of you who are young, a VCR <laughs> is, is a video player before CDs. Um, you should Google it. it it'll be helpful for you. And the opening is fairly large, and she would stuff things in there like her toys. And she knew we didn't like this very much, but yet she continued to do it. And we knew that this was becoming a problem because at one point, as she's walking toward it, she had a cookie in her hand. We knew what she wanted to do because there was a twinkle in her eyes. And she reached, and we said, no, Anna. She looked back, 
This is why we know she heard us. And then she stuffed it in. <laughs> Nonetheless. Have you seen your kids do that? That's called sin. It's not just an action that follows after unrighteous and ungodly things. It's about a condition that overwhelms us. Thus, verse 10 reminds us we are enemies of God. We are in rebellion against God. Not satisfied with ignoring God, we actively and with focus rebelled against God. God. This is where the chapter 1 of Romans remind us we've traded God for everything else, thinking that that's where our satisfaction and significance will come from. Not only is he making this personal for us, he has actually a personal testimony of this in 1 Timothy. When he says in 1 Timothy 1.15 that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, Paul says, a foremost or chief or the worst, as the NIV translates it. This repeats a pattern of the greatest apostle expressing his understanding of his personal spiritual state prior to Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 says, I am the least of the apostles. Ephesians 3, 8 says, to me, I am the very least of all the saints. For Paul, this is an honest and brutal look at self. This is not an explanation of self based on comparisons with others, as if to say, I am at least better than them. This is Paul's view of himself in a spiritual mirror before meeting Christ and recognizing, convicted by sin. This is the kind of life that he led. John Stott says, the truth is rather that when we are convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit, an immediate result is that we give up all comparisons. Paul was so vividly aware of his own sins that he could not conceive that anybody could be worse. It is the language of every sinner whose conscience has been awakened and disturbed by the Holy Spirit. Apart from Christ, we are sinners, rebels against God, weak impotent, ungodly, unrighteous. But this is not where the story ends, does it? Romans 5, 6, and 8, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8 goes on to say, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This seems to be Paul's theological logic. God loves I mean, that is, after all, who he is. God loves. And then he goes on to point out God loves us when we were ungodly and unlovable. We often project our shortcomings upon God, and since the love that we practice on a daily basis with our spouses as well as our children is conditional, selfish, you scratch my back, I scratch your back, And ever-changing, we assume along the same line, consciously or unconsciously, our Father in Heaven's love for us is quite similar. But God shows how different and shocking the love of God is. We know that His love is different because God loves despite knowing who we really are. Even behind closed doors, things that we've never told even our spouses in our miserable and unlovable state. But it's not only that God loves, and God loves us when we're unlovable. God loves us enough to send his son to die. It's ultimately sacrificial. He came at the right time, but coming at the right time was insufficient because there was a purpose to his coming. Jesus Christ came which itself is a a huge blessing for us that God will come in the human form to be with us. But he came to die. Romans 8.32 says, God did not spare his own son. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. That God would give up his son. It involves a gruesome death of a criminal upon the cross, Christ died, we're told in chapter 5, verse 6. Christ died, again, we're told in verse 8. His blood was shed, verse 9 says. He came to die for us. Philippians, in this wonderful hymn, says, Who, though he was in the form of God, 
did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But it's not generically as if it's something distant to us that he came, that he died, but that he died for us, for you and I, the undeserving, the unloving, and in fact, rebellious, and individuals who are running away from God. That person, he died for us twice, he repeats, for you and for me. In loving us, he went to the limit. What else could he have done for us? This is shocking for us in many ways. All this for those who are sinners, ungodly, weak, and enemies when most people would not even give themselves up for a righteous person, he says. Friends, this is such an important point for us, isn't it? Not only for our message as a witness, but for me and for us. Because what this means is simply this. In Romans 8, the language switches, doesn't it? The language switches in verses 14 through 17 in Romans 8 to say this, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Every one of these verses speak in this family terms, sons of God as sons, children of God, children. Notice the contrast with these words, with the words that were used in chapter 5, apart from Christ. Weak, ungodly, sinners, rebel. You know what changed? What changed is us because of Jesus Christ. It is because of Jesus Christ we've been transferred from the state where sin dominated our hearts and our lives now into a new state of a right relationship with our God, the Father in heaven, that we are able to cry out daily without shame and fear, our Father in heaven, we say. What does this mean practically for you and I? Friends, this means those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior belong to him. You belong to him. This is important for us. Your value and your significance is based on the very fact that you belong to him. To put it another way, God doesn't love you because you're valuable, but you're valuable because you're loved in the first place. The world says that you're valuable because of your successes, your education, your experience, the letters behind your name, or the size of your church, or the successes of your ministry, but God says that you're valuable simply because you belong to him in Christ Jesus our Lord. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in America or Cambodia or Australia or any other countries that you can speak of. It doesn't matter. You're valuable not on the basis of what you do, you are not what you do, nor are you what you accomplish. You are someone because you belong to him. I told you I love sports. A few years ago, I was watching the Summer Olympics this time in Brazil. And this is, again, another chance for us to watch something that we don't watch for nearly four years. And one of them is called a 10-meter uh, platform diving. We tell our children never to jump off, but for somehow it's okay to jump off from 10-meter platforms. But it's not enough that that was scary in and of itself. We decided that we wanted to make the difficulty higher by creating what they call a synchronized 10-meter platform diving, which is two people jumping off the 10-meter platform together. It's, it's a beautiful sight to behold. Now, after winning gold four years previously, uh, David Badaya, an American diver, this time partnered with Steele Johnson to win silver, which was a huge accomplishment. 
when the interviewer sent by NBC came up to ask him questions about how they did all this and how they handled the pressure, this is what David replied. It's just an identity crisis. When my mind is on this diving and I'm thinking I'm defined by this, then my mind goes crazy. But we know, we both know, that our identity is in Christ. And we're thankful for this opportunity to be able to dive in front of Brazil and in front of the United States. It's been an absolutely thrilling moment for us. Now, international TV, Jesus doesn't get spoken of often on interviews like this. The person interviewing was slightly nervous, I think. This is my interpretation. And so she quickly takes the microphone away from David, who's going to continue to talk about Jesus, and brought it over to Steele Johnson, right? I mean, it's not only that he speaks about Jesus, he speaks about Jesus accurately. It's not just something pointing at this, you know, the, 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 the heavens as if that's supposed to indicate something about their belief, but he's actually talking about his identity being in Christ, that it's not about the medal because he's already won. This is where Steele Johnson chimes in and says, the way David just described it was flawless. <laughs> the fact that I was going into this event knowing that my identity is rooted in Christ and not what the result of this competition is just gave me peace, and it let me enjoy the contest. You, brothers and sisters, belong to Jesus Christ. No longer weak, ungodly, sinners, rebels, but now because of Jesus Christ, you have become sons and daughters. That is your defining marker. You are not what you do, and you are not what the world says you are, and you are not defined by your successes and failures. You are defined by you being in Christ Jesus, and your Father loves you and saved you from the dominion of sinful death. This is our joy, isn't it? This is why we want to share it. I'm sure my missionary friends here would agree with me in saying part of the result of all this is what Paul describes for us in Romans 5, 1 and 2, when he says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because of Christ Jesus, we have several things we're told. And I'm going to just tell you three things here shown to us in verses 1 and 2. First, we have peace with God. You belong to him. You have peace with God. What does Paul mean by peace? Often we assume that peace is primarily a subjective feeling. It is well with my soul. That song always breaks me down. It is well with my soul, sense of personal well-being. That everything seems all right. Certainly Paul does speak of this subjective inner peace, often referring to the peace from God that he provides. But in this verse, Paul speaks of peace with God. Peace with God. A change in status in our relationship with God, no longer as enemies who rebelled against God and deserving his wrath, but we are now reconciled and favored by God as his sons and daughters. We have peace with God, no longer standing in enmity as enemies, now embraced and accepted and welcomed by him. Do you ever remember how much of a privilege it is that we can begin our, our Lord's Prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven? You're talking to the King of kings and Lord of lords, the judge who is perfection is demanded. But because we approach him clothed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus our Lord, there is peace, no fear. Second thing he says is that we have access to God by faith. Access to God by faith. We spent a couple months in Korea when my son was about two months old. And when he came back, all the sleep training that my wife did so faithfully went out the door. 
And uh, because in Korea we were staying with our relatives, we all slept in the same room, which was, frankly speaking, I love my kids, terrible. Um, here, he got used to sleeping next to his parents, so he would want to come in all the time. And so after a while, I couldn't take it anymore. So I told him, don't come in sternly. I gave him a strong warning. And in fact, when he did come in, I, I actually got really upset with him for coming in, which my, my wife, uh, dear heart, she, her heart was broken that her husband was so, so, so uh, not understanding of the children's needs. So he developed this, unfortunately, I, this is too much of a confession probably. Um, <laughs> we would fall asleep, and when I'm sleeping, he would come in and sleep at the foot of our bed with his blanket. As soon as he heard me get up, you hear these footsteps running out. <laughs> Just running out. After a while, my wife spoke to me. She said, you, you can't do that. So we let him in. We let him in as long as he wanted to in order that he can get some rest, and we too uh, can get some rest as well. You know what? I wouldn't let anyone else do that. <laughs> you try that, I'll kick you out without any remorse. <laughs> He has access, because he's my child, into the inner chambers he may enter, without fear, without hindrance, unfettered access into the very presence of God. It's the incredible privilege we have that because of Jesus Christ, you in your moments of prayer, thank you for that intercessory prayer earlier as well, you have access to the Father in heaven the King of kings and Lord of lords who loves you and watches over you. Paul reminds us we have peace with God and access to God by faith. And finally, he tells us we rejoice as he ends our section that we read, uh, read with rejoicing. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The, the word rejoice is perhaps better translated boast, as many of your ESV translations indicate as a footnote. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. What does this mean? It means that we have confidence in our future. Despite the sufferings all around us as a result of sin, despite the pain that sometimes life brings right before us, despite the uncertainties of our future, as well as the shame of our past, what we now know in Christ Jesus before our Father, we have confidence before him. God, who declared us righteous in Christ Jesus, will not and cannot change his mind, giving us assurance that our standing before him, no matter the changing circumstances and the promised glory are certain and definite. This future hope of the glory of God gives us confidence and joy as we live our daily lives, as we continue to labor faithfully on this side of glory. We are able to rejoice in the midst of suffering, as Paul says in Colossians 1.24, because we know, not because we love suffering, not because we want to bring it on as if that would allow us to be seen as someone more faithful, simply because we know in the midst of our valleys and weaknesses, God is there and is in charge. Even the sufferings themselves produce good in us because our God is in charge of all things in Christ Jesus our Lord. In belonging to him, we have peace with him. We have access to our Father in heaven, and we have this confidence-building hope of the glory of God. Who wouldn't want to share this good news with people? When we find anything good in our lives, whether they be toys, sports equipment, or some kind of activity we're engaged in, we cannot wait to tell someone. You know how that feels. We have this precious treasure, and as Paul says, in jars of clay like ours, but we have this treasure with us. And many of our friends, dear sisters and brothers, desire to share this the state that they're in, the state that we have been brought into with Christ Jesus our Lord and the peace that we have our Lord in heaven. This is why Paul says in Romans 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, he says. And then he goes on this 
continuous question for us to explore when he says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Good question, but not done. How are they to believe in whom they have never heard? Good follow-up question, but there's another one when he says, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? That's a great question. And then he goes on to finish for us when he says, how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. The video earlier asked, why should you go? We have a lot of beautiful feet here people who are bringing good news to many. Let me tell you one personal reason. My dear friends and I, when we were in Korea a couple years back, visited Yanghwa Jin Foreign Missionary Cemetery in Seoul, South Korea. As the name indicates, this is where 145 foreign missionaries to Korea and their family members are now buried and remembered. Among them are the families of Henry G. Oppenzeller, Horace G. Underwood, and William D. Reynolds. Underwood from Northern Presbyterian Church in the U.S., William Reynolds from the Southern Presbyterian Church in the U.S. during the 1880s and 1890s. Reynolds was a professor at Pyongyang Theological Seminary that I shared with you about last night, producing the first complete translation of the Bible in Korean, which was published in 1910. However, this was not without great cost. Soon after their arrival in 1892, the Reynolds gave birth to their first son, William Davis. Their joy was soon followed by grief as little William died the same year he was born, now buried alongside many other children of missionaries who died while their parents served in Korea. In one corner of this foreign missionary cemetery are the gravestones that are far smaller with names and dates, simply of children, dozens upon dozens of children of missionaries who committed themselves during the late 1800s and beginning of 1900s who died in the country in which they were serving. The graves of these children at Yanghua Jin were sober reminders to us of the sacrifices many missionaries and, frankly, their families have made to proclaim this beautiful good news throughout the world. How beautiful are their feet. And friends, I am, and many of you are, the fruit of their labors. You have no idea when the Lord will bring it to full bloom, but full bloom they will become because the Lord does not waste his time. May the Lord use us and move us, whether as goers or senders, that we may be able to share the good news that comes to us in Christ Jesus our Lord, that we may proclaim it from the mountaintops without any shame, but with boldness and confidence. For the word that goes forth will not come back in vain, and he will, he will bring to himself his sons and daughters who are lost. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we want to lift up to you our brothers and sisters who are here, O Lord, who, despite what the world might think of them, set aside their aspirations and desires to put their feet upon the ground in various parts of the world to share your word, this good news, how beautiful are their works and their feet, O Lord. We pray for your uh, blessings to be upon them. Protect them from loneliness. Lord, allow them to be surrounded by good co-workers. Show them fruit of the labor that they are engaged in, O Lord, that they may be able to rejoice in you, but most of all, remind them daily that they belong to you, that their identity is not the successes and failures of their ministry, but simply because Christ loves them and chased after them. Be with us, O Lord, who are stateside, many who are missionaries in our own places, whether it be in our unbelieving family, whether it be among our friends who are walking away from the Lord, whether it be in our churches, O Lord, where many who are inquisitive but not yet knowing you fully are among us. Pray that you embolden us, O Lord. This good 
news that we have received in Christ Jesus, this peace and joy that you have granted us, Lord, that we will not hide that, but Lord, that we may share it and that we may do so with great joy and conviction and pride. For, O oh Lord, we belong to you when we boast in your name and name alone. Thank you for this morning. As we spend this day, O oh Lord, strengthen our body and our minds to be able to enjoy one another's company. Open our eyes to see your work all over the world. Encourage us, O oh Lord, 